if you could read the next item. That's going to take us to uh, item F2, Galita Train Depot Status Update and TIRCP Supplemental Funding. Thank you. All right. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, we're aware of the time and we wanted to give kind of an abbreviated version of what you have in your staff report. The, the main areas of focus we want to um, bring to your attention is obviously uh, we can do a, a brief overview of what's happened with the train depot and the latest you know, design and that um, what's, what's come about since the last time you saw it in January of this year, actually, when you approved the EIR. Um, the second one, and most importantly for uh, staff, is to authorize uh, this evening the city manager to set aside $1 million um, as committed fund balance as a possible match for supplemental TERSIP funding. TERSIP is the uh, California State, um, it's the uh, transit and inner city rail capital program. It's the original funding that uh, the city secured to help build this uh, train depot. So briefly, um, background, you have it in your staff report. Um, won't bore you with too much of that. Um, read at your leisure as well, again, and to the, to the community. Uh, one thing we wanted to highlight, just in terms of cost um, that have increased over time, is we did have some run-ins with um, costs going up as a result of going to the design review, review board uh, a number of times, I think it was three times. Um, and I think in all sincerity, that did create a better product. Um, and we're well aware of that and very thankful for that. But it did create some delays in time, additional uh, resources. Um, and then also just historically, the uh, cost estimate that was provided at the time the grant submittal was done was very rudimentary in terms of what was submitted. It was on a very, very tight timeline. Uh, and uh, essentially, it, it came from uh, architects' drawings and some projections out. Um, in order to be competitive, we had to submit it and to, to get onto it. Um, but as, as we all know, things have changed in 2018 was a different environment. Um, and then we find ourselves now in 2022, uh, now reaching the 100% design uh, plans, which we can uh, quickly go through uh, for your convenience. But really it, it boils down to the construction costs of the project have substantially grown. Uh, we've taken attempts uh, at the 35% drawings to reduce those through a process called uh, value engineering. Uh, shrinking the size of the building, uh, looking at materials, uh, construction methods, all the all the above, including looking at the site itself and and what's required in order to to produce this project. Um, with that, still, uh, we, we just got the most recent cost estimate for construction, which is included in your staff report. And so, what we did is, um, almost fittingly enough, um, in November fifteenth, uh, all of a sudden, there's a source of additional supplemental funds from TERSIP, which uh, kind of go in line with kind of the, the pain and pressure we've been feeling, which is uh, construction costs, construction costs, construction costs, inflation. Um, and it was an opportunity for us to submit and to help um, bridge that funding gap. Um, that had a quick turnaround. Um, I think the final due date was December 6th. Turnaround for awards will be in January. Um, and. We'll know more then how competitive we actually are. At the end of the day, the $1 million is essentially 15% of the additional uh, construction costs that we're looking at that we need uh, out of a total of 6.59 million. Uh, we submitted 5.59 million for uh, the request at TERSIP. And in order to, to really have a, a competitive chance, uh, we had to have some sort of a match showing that the city had skin in the game. Um, with that said, I, I want to give an opportunity to to Mr. Kamada, if you want to share anything else that he thinks I'm missing, I know we're going to try to go fairly quickly on this, but essentially I think that's the, the core uh, question for the council this evening. Thank you, Jaime. Uh, oops. Madam Mayor, members of the council, I think the only thing I would add is um, regarding the supplemental tercip funding and the competitive nature of it, the intent, as we understand from SBCAG and also uh, attending the the uh, workshops that they um, put on is is to leverage federal funding that many of these uh, rail projects have as well as other local funding but really the big money was in the federal and if they weren't able to secure additional state funding 
this heavy monstrous chunks of federal funding would be lost for these huge rail projects. So this was the, the impetus. Um, so now we're coming in as, as a small project um, and the advice and, and counsel we got was we had to establish some, some level of leverage to make it attractive, otherwise we'd just get lost in, in, the, big, in the big pool. So um, maybe that provides a little more justification for the million dollars. And, and with that, if it's okay with the council, I was going to go briefly through these slides. You have them in your packet, more so for uh, visually to see kind of what it looks like uh, as of now. Um, first of all, is the proposed site plan. There's been some modifications over time. Uh, a lot of it had to do with parking um, and, and adding kind of a little bit more landscaping along these buffered lines on the, what would be what, the west side of the, uh, the property and to the south. Uh, that originally hadn't been uh, part of it. Um, the building itself, trying to shrink it um, and make better use of these exterior pylons. Um, uh, the, the, you know, all of the um, items having to do with drainage, all of those things are, are real cost pressures for the for the building and for the project. Um, and having to address those, the electronic uh, electric vehicle parking, um, the solar roofing, all those things are are what we uh, heard loud and clear from DRB, from the community that were important. Uh, we've also been um, on a parallel track working with our lead consultants to, to secure platinum status for uh, this this project if we can. And the city's uh, minimum threshold is silver. Um, so we're still trying on, on multiple fronts to get to the points where we can uh, be uh, hopefully even at gold and if, if we're able to make it to platinum. Um, the roadway improvements and how this enters into the building um, and the site have been uh, adjusted with in, uh, input from numerous stakeholders, including local property owners, uh, the folks from SB Bike and Coast. Um, not everyone is getting exactly what they wanted, um, but we do feel like we have the opportunity to meet, you know, heads and shoulders above what's already there. And that was one of the real uh, primary uh, reasons for going after the grant. Uh, the next slide, just a visual of what it would look like from coming in from that uh, perspective. Again, a lot of this came from DRB in terms of uh, color palette, um, kind of the, the look and feel of the building. We even, we even had a small uh, subgroup of folks that we worked with to really get into the details. Um, so we're, we're very excited to bring this forward. It's got a lot of uh, a positive attention. Again, some additional exterior views so you can see what it looks like uh, if you're standing in front of the building, kind of to the side. And one thing to note is it, there is no back of the house for this building. It's a very, very public building from the sense that you have to look at it from every single dimension. So you can't really cut corners here or cut corners over here because you have to essentially be able to view it from, from every angle. Interior views, this just gives you a sense of kind of the, the presence, the height, um, some of the color palettes that we're looking at to create those neutrals. Um, uh, feelings and uh, neutral um, color palettes, but also the uh, importance that we've placed on durable materials, um, things that, that look great but actually um, age even better. Um, uh, one unique feature, I think we brought this up in the past, was um, on the west side of the building, uh, creating in, within this uh, multi-purpose room, this kind of community room, the ability to have kind of inside, outside access uh, to the rest of the site. Um, we really wanted to create something that was inviting, that could serve multiple purposes, and, and this is kind of a unique feature of the building. Um, you'll see on the on the right side, um, you know, kind of how the lighting from the above. Um, um, God, I'm looking for the word. What is Skylight. it? Skylights um, uh, provide lighting for the, for the uh, facility. Um, really hard to see the detail on this, but this is the floor plan. You'll see uh, in general. Here's the multi-purpose uh, community meeting room. We have an electric room here, right off the side of it, furniture storage here. Um, there are men's and women's bathrooms and also a gender neutral bathroom that was included out of, after we got some feedback um, that we thought was actually incredibly worthwhile and, and helpful. Um, we also have some avail available office space. Uh, we could have sheriff officers work out of there if needed. Um, there's also uh, a space available for um, staff from, from Amtrak or even other bus uh, operators if they needed to use some of that space. So we try to design this as flexible as possible. Um, and then also you have kind of just what you would normally think of, which is the main waiting area here, 
along with benches around uh, to take advantage of our beautiful weather. Not necessarily right now when it's 40 degrees out, but um, certainly for throughout most of the year. And then one of the other bigger features was a cafe uh, on site uh, to serve as you know either a restaurant or um, kind of food service, the kind of quick meals uh, for people to get um, on on their way out, on their way here. Uh, we'd also be looking at um, lease opportunities with more established uh, restaurants if they wanted to have like a quick to go area, but then also have an actual sit down uh, place for for food. And uh, just some of the color palettes that have been selected over the time. There's some influences that we see here related to um, members of the Chumash who have been really good about sharing their time and their um, ideas. Um, they've, they've expressed uh, a gratitude for, for actually reaching out to them and including them. Um, we'll also be talking to them a little bit more, I think, at the end of January and February, just to make sure that we do things in a culturally appropriate way. Uh, the number of uh, language, uh, versions of the language that will be used to describe some of the landscape uh, materials uh, or landscape plants. Um, and then also taking inspiration from some of the patterns that um, we've uh, kind of coordinated with them to see if, if they were appropriate. Um, one thing to keep in mind is um, we're not trying to recreate anything. Uh, we're, we're trying to show and demonstrate uh, influences of the area. So we don't want to make something that's um, looks like we're trying to copy something, right, without being um, um, true to the to the culture and then also making note of that in in the um, signage in the area to give people perspective and some of the history behind that. So that was a very important uh, part of that process. Site furnishings. Um, these are just some examples. We promise the caterpillar will not be that color. We'll, <laughs> we'll make sure to have something uh, a little more. Um, you get what I'm saying. And then, um, so these are some of the, the features that we want to have, though, in, in order to um, not have it look so cookie cutter, have it be functional. Um, and then lastly, we're just going to leave this open for questions. Uh, we realize it's late, but um, this is an important um moment in the in the process and uh we're looking for your feedback and your direction so thank you for that <laughs> councilman carrio thank you i'll keep my uh my questions very brief um can you just give us a status um you know a lot of what's driving this from the value proposition perspective for glita residents and glita businesses is the uh the commuter rail service aspect um, that's created um, by this project so where are we at with uh losan adding um customer commuter rail service you know, to Southern California in this area? Well, thank you for asking that question. And just, um, I was forgot to introduce the team, but we actually have Gerald Kamadi here, for, obviously from COM3, who's been helping on this project for quite some time. And um, thankfully, Aaron Bonfilio, who is the, now the director of transit um, at um, SBCAG, is actually on the phone or on the Zoom call this evening. Um, so we wanted to have him here to help address some of those questions to get to the most up-to-date information. And um, if it's okay <laughs> with the council, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Bonfilio. So you can go ahead and unmic. Perfect. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, uh, members of the council. Uh, Aaron Bonfilio for SBCAG. Um, as Jaime mentioned, um, I'm here to help answer any questions regarding the project. And specifically to your uh, question, Councilmember Cariaco, the um, Low Sand Rail Agency did cut back quite a bit of service during the pandemic, which we all know, and now operates a, a much reduced level of service. But they are bringing service back um, in phases. Um, in particular, they have an optimization plan, which was adopted by the, the Low Sand Agency earlier this year, um, which calls for eight round trips per day to and from the station every two hours. Um, presently, that schedule is going to be from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. arrivals and departures would be would leave from the station as early as 6 a.m. Um, and return back, um, or the last train out of there would be uh, close to 9 p.m. Um, that said, one of the two trains that is presently slotted but not yet scheduled for return would be the morning arrival train uh, just before 8 a.m. Um, but we are working, uh, SBCAG is, with VCTC in Ventura County, where I was previously for about a decade, um, and Metrolink, um, the SCRA, um, VCTC is a member agency of, the, of their system, and we're working with them on a possible demonstration pilot, and we'll be receiving a proposal a little bit later, um, early into the calendar year. 
Um, but that said, uh, Losan does have that slot available still um, that would arrive early uh, morning, and we hope to make use of it one way or the other, either with Losan or with Metrolink using um, our leverage and partnership with VCTC. Okay. Just a quick follow-up. Would there be any opportunity with Metrolink or the other provider um, to have at least one trip a day that is on the earlier side for those businesses that have a little bit more of an you know around the clock schedule, or I was talking to some some local employers recently that they do four ten schedules, and so they have people that come in like six in the morning or seven in the morning, and they work a long day, and then that allows them to only work like a Monday through Thursday schedule. Would there be any possibility of having something from MetroLink where they could or someone else where they could come in earlier, like get here at six or get here at seven? to meet the needs of those businesses, particularly some of the tech businesses that like to offer those more flexible work uh, situations so that they can uh, maximize people coming to the office rather than just wanting to work remote? Potentially. Um, in our request to Metrolink for their proposal, we, we identified three times in the morning um, because one train, frankly, is really not enough. Uh, commuters need options. They need backups if they're running late, for example. Um, fortunately, the Coastal Express bus service does arrive as early as 515 in Goleta. Um, but that said, we know that the train is very attractive, especially to the, the businesses along the rail line there. Um, so that, that is something that we're considering. Um, it is challenged by the fact that we don't have a lot of capacity on the line for dual trains to pass one another. And there is a train departing Goleta at about a quarter to seven um, in the future plan. So headed south. Um, that so that we need to time it and make sure that we're working um, in both directions in concert. But but yes, that is in the proposal. Thank you, Mr. Bonfilio. Mayor Pro Tem Richards. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> along those lines, uh, I also see that there's some budget um, that's mentioned in here regarding the Losan um, SBCAG network integration plan. Um, can can you describe what that entails? Sure. Um, it was completed uh, just before my time at SBCAG, but um, I did uh, participate in the advisory committee that met with um, uh, the former director, Scott Spaulding, and, and staff. Um, effectively, uh, Cal STA, or the California State Transportation Agency, uh, was in the process of de developing network integration plans all across the state in that cycle of, of TIRCP funding and identified uh, awardees for recipient of funds to develop network integration plans. While we in Santa Barbara County um, were the recipient of the funding and helped facilitate development of that plan, that plan was effectively to facilitate the state's needs to um, further build the state rail plan and the California intercity bus plan. So while on the one hand, it was a project that we led here in Santa Barbara County, it was part of a greater program um, throughout the state and you'll see uh, through that same cycle, awards to Monterey Salinas Transit and other agencies um, to develop network integration plans as well. Okay, that thank you. that's helpful. Um, I also see in that budget uh, sheet it mentions the purchase of electric vehicles. Um, can you describe uh, or remind me? I don't know if we learned about how they would be used, but can you um, tell us about that? Sure. A, a collection of, of projects were submitted in concert with the. Uh, the uh, Goleta train depot um, and shuttles were included. Um, at the time, it was envisioned that those shuttles would operate as um, first last mile connections to local institutions, the airport, UCSB, uh, for example. Um, SBMTD was also a recipient um, of, of electric vehicles through the state trans, um, transit and intercity rail capital, Cor capital program. And due to some redundancy in service, um, those electric vehicles have been shifted over to the Easy Lift ADA paratransit service. Um, however, the, the goal with MTD is still to provide electric shuttle um, or electric minivan connections to and from the station in what they're calling their on demand wave program. I think MTD has come to the council before, they've made presentations here in the city. Um, and, and just to further clarify a point that was made earlier regarding the supplemental funding and this opportunity, it is only available to awardees if they are bringing local uh, or federal funding to the table. So, for example, um, this project would not be eligible 
um, to uh, submit for supplemental funding if there was not either a federal component or uh, local dollars um, as a match. And if I could just add on to that briefly, part of that is not, we can't point back to what we spent previously, like the acquisition, which was $6.7 million, which is a very, very large uh, portion of the project cost as a whole. So I think to his point, you know, we have to have new um, commitments that were um, not part of a, a previous application. Okay, thanks. Um, a couple other questions, and I think this is maybe just for our staff here, regarding the electric vehicle uh, stations, and I know that that's part of the plan, is to um, have some electric vehicle charging in the parking lot. I know that when we you know, first planned this several years ago, there were certain requirements or certain uh, numbers of EV stations that we thought was appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, I also know that those numbers are seem to be increasing, like there's more and more demand for them and more and more interest and more and more people driving EVs. Have we looked at uh, whether the numbers that we have uh, programmed in here for EV charging stations is appropriate? And if not, is there a way that we can at least um, have the wiring there for you know adding them later if the cost is too much to add them now? Sure, and I'll, I'll make a first quick attempt. We also have our uh, architect on the line as well that we can call on to, uh, Mr. Jim Keenan um, is in attendance. But really, um, one thing we found through this process is that the city's uh, title or chapter, section 17, I'll call it that, chapter 17, uh, title 17 of the Goleta Municipal Code is one where the standard for uh, requirements for charger EV chargers per stalls, per 10 stalls, uh, was already really high compared to the state um, uh, 2019 Cal Green requirements. So our requirements here were 10%, um, while Cal Green's were 6%. So we were already kind of ahead of the game back in 2019, 2018. Um, and it appears that um, Cal Green's codes will, will be trying to match those codes uh, coming uh, either this year or next year. Um, but we do feel like that we've taken the evaluation in terms of looking at um, what the the whole project as a whole is intended to do. Uh, I want to reemphasize for the folks at home that this is a greenhouse gas funded um, funding, right, source. Um, it's intended to reduce greenhouse gases. And so part of that is the rail, but it's also the electric, the electric vehicles, uh, electrical vehicle charging. So we believe we're, we're at the point where we're providing 12 EV charging stations, which we believe is a, a fairly good amount. Um, but we also have uh, taken the opportunity to make sure that we have uh, additional capacity going forward. Um, so I'll ask uh, Mr. Keenan to, to add on to that and so I don't pretend to be a expert. Um, Mr. Keenan, if you're there. You're, you can speak now. Okay, thank you, Jaime. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, currently we do meet the uh, actually, the future Cal Green requirement is ten percent. Um, there are some nuances to the new Cal Green requirement as far as the the type of EV charger, the tier one versus tier two versus tier three. So um, we'll be incorporating that as well. Um, we have bus charging. Um, uh, we have stub outs for future bus charging, so that when these uh, we have two stops for the buses. Um, to allow for that. Currently, the um, the way the, the existing electrical is set up out there, there's an existing transformer trying to utilize on the uh, mounted on a pole. And um, we're adding a second um, transformer mounted on the pole specifically for, for EV charging. It allows for a few more stations uh, in the uh, to be added in the future. Um, but if we were to add, you know, if we were to go into the 15 to 20 EV charger uh, station range, we'd have to add a, a ground mounted transformer. And that would take up more space and be basically abandon the existing uh, pole mounted transformer. So it's part of a, a cost saving measure of using existing infrastructure as well as, um, you know, trying to save space on the on the ground to to maximize the number of parking stalls okay yeah yeah I, I would just say that i i would like us to try to have you know as many as we can uh programmed uh, especially given that we're already looking at 17 
here at City Hall. And I think that, uh, you know, using a parking lot at a train station seems to be a prime location for where we would want to have that for the people that are traveling, that are, that are parking their car there, that aren't, you know, hopefully uh, not driving around at that point. You know, so, uh, I, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, putting just the wires underground or whatever we can to maximize what that would be, I, I would, I would be a proponent of that. Uh, and then along the same lines, uh, what about battery storage? I thought we had talked about it, but I can't remember where we landed. Um, is there any battery storage, you know, l looking at the resiliency of the building and hopefully, you know, creating some kind of microgrid, we're going to have the solar panels on the roof already. Sure, we actually have, um, Mr. Keating can also address that as well from, from the uh, project standpoint. Yes, there's, uh, fortunately, there is an existing generator on site um, and we were trying to utilize that. That was one of the directions we had early on, was to try to, um, since it's a fairly new generator, to try to utilize that as our, our uh, backup uh, on the power. Um, we have a, a space located um, for battery storage. Uh, we also have conduits running for the future battery storage so that as that existing generator phases out, maybe in the next few decades that there's space for uh, for the um, for batteries to be installed uh, currently with Tesla the roofing system they, they provide they do not require battery um, storage for the uh, commercial type of system it's a very their, their commercial batteries are very cost prohibitive they're very expensive but they're uh, and they're five foot by 30 foot and uh, they're coming out with some new um, uh, mega packs, new um, battery storage that's going to be smaller and more efficient um, in the next, uh, I think, 2000, quarter three, 2024. So there's uh, some stuff that's going to be coming up, but we do have the infrastructure there for battery storage. Um, and it's the conduits are, are laid out so that they are connected to the inverter system that we will be installing at the uh, at the uh, electrical room. And when you say existing generator, of uh, how is that powered? It's a diesel generator uh, with a below ground tank. Oh, okay. Hmm. It's existing from the warehouse that's uh, being demolished. Okay. Well, that's disappointing. I mean, it's not disappointing that, that it's there, but I, I would hope that we can try to avoid using diesel, especially if this is a a project funded by you know, reducing gre greenhouse gas. No, and, and part of it is the there's kind of two aspects to it. There's the Tesla roof system, which is the solar portion of it. And really for the backup powers in case of an emergency, um, we certainly understand the desire to move towards battery storage. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's a close to a hundred thousand uh, dollar diesel generator that has a significant amount of life left. If at some point there's a decision to move that somewhere else or get rid of it, I mean, that, that could certainly be, uh, discussed and, and thought through, but uh, every step of the process, we've we've had this be part of it, and so to try to change that now is just going to add that funding gap a little a little harder uh, to to find a way to cover. But um, we definitely have been trying to find every single way to score higher on on lead, um, and we recognize that you know that's not ideal to have, but it is something that's better for an emergency to to be fail safe um, at this point. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Kasdan. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a lot to add. The, the questions I was interested in got uh, asked. I just wanted to uh, sort of add, I think it's great how you're reaching out to all the different groups, including the Chumash and the work of the um, Design Review Board. It looks great. It really does, and uh, I commend the work that you guys have done. It's going to be a really beautiful building, so that's that's all I have. Do we have any speakers that would like to speak to this? If you have any member of the public wishes to speak to this item, please use the raised hand icon, and I will call on you. Uh, seeing none, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I think I'm, we're looking for a motion. Oh, I'm happy to make the motion. Okay. Let me get it up here. Um, 
Um, well, I guess the motion would just be to authorize the city manager to set aside uh, $1 million as a committed fund balance for a possible match for supplemental transit and inner city rail capital program requested funding for the Goleta train depot project from the city's unassigned fund balance. I'll second that. Okay. Any more discussion? Not seeing none, then we will do a roll call vote. Councilmember Kasdan. Aye. Councilmember Kiriako. Aye. Councilmember Reyes Martin. Aye. Mayor Pro Tempore Richards. Yes. And Mayor Perotti. Aye. It's unanimous. The ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you so much.